Hi, I'm Chris from Windows, and hey, you could do this. So it's January. We made it to 2024. And what I'm thinking is, last January, I kind of just chilled out through uh, the beginning of 2023 and did a kind of inhale thing. I basically didn't post stuff and just kind of recentered. I don't think I'm going to need to drop out of sight, but I am not so worried about posting lots of plugins in January of this year. So I'm kind of running around doing some of the things that also interest me. And here's one. Remember this stuff? This started out as, well, hang on. Let me go and grab one. Okay, so here's something I've done before with the idea of letting people construct a little tool like this. This is my circle of fifths calculations for how to come up with chords. And it's been a big piece of everything that I've done musically over the last year, which some people are enjoying. Yeah, other people, they don't have to like it. But Here's the thing. Actually, hang on. Let me run around getting all the things I need to get. Yeah, you see, I usually have other irons in the fire besides just only plug-in making, because life is not plug-in making alone. There's such a thing as too many plugins, and it's what you do with it. And one of the things I've done is I was doing things like making mouse pads with the same information written on it. This also has my tempo work on there. And I did the chord thing as a slide rule. And it's got this information written on there where it'll say like Ionian major and C, meaning that if you were in the key of C, you can bounce around and play chords in this vertical slot, the ones to the side are the new chords that you have available if you shift to these keys. Like if you go one to this side, you're then in the key of F, and these chords become available in the key of F. If you go this direction, you go from the key of C to the key of G. Again, it's based on whether it's a major chord. And then if you go one beyond, you're in the key of D, so stepping two over, you go from C major to D major, like your classic end of a track, jumping up a whole step for extra. Anyways, you, you are then in these chords. And I've, I've had my fun with these things, but I've never heard of anybody cutting out and making slide rules like this, nor was anybody asking for a mouse pad with this stuff written on it. So fortunately, I didn't go and make a bunch of them. That's kind of what I was figuring as I was going to see whether it was interesting to anybody. Well, I've come up with something new to do, and it's this week's thing that I'm giving people. It is a single page as a PDF, and you can print this out and then tape the, the top to the bottom at which point you have a little chord guide. And a new thing that I've added is, here's the piano keyboard with the notes that you use. Like if you're all the way over into the key of F sharp, right? F sharp is uh, the major key. And you see that you're playing all of the black keys and these two white keys, everything else is grayed out. That's what gives you the stuff in the key of F sharp. On the other hand, if you were doing th something in minor, you could look for F sharp minor. That's the one on the end here. And we can find it. That makes it the key of A if you were in major. So it's the relative minor of the key of A. If there are any actual music experts that in 
correcting something dumb that I'm saying, then by all means correct me. But I believe this is how this works. If you're in the key of F-sharp minor rather than major, it's these notes you're going to be playing on the keyboard. And just as importantly, these are the chords that you could play in it. That said, that is like modal chord theory. And you don't have to stick to only modal chord theory. For instance, the song Hey Joe just cycles through a bunch of keys. For instance, C major, G major, D major, A major, E major, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, back to C major, and so on. You can bounce around through different keys rapidly. But if you wanted to solo over those chords and hit all the right notes, you would be sticking to, like, C major, you're playing the white keys. G major, the stuff that you're playing could also include, oops, we're at the wrong hand here, this black note. D major, you'd have these two black notes. By the time you got to E major, you'd be playing these notes. Or the same thing on guitar. Or you could just wail away in E major and maybe try to remember the other notes. The notes, for instance, in that beginning C chord. These are the ones that you could throw in and have it sound right. And the idea with this that I just put together today is that knowing enough of this stuff to be able to uh, think of something to do is a way of not being intimidated by the challenge of full-on music theory, of how demanding that all is. And this is a tool for me. This kind of stuff, I mean, notably the mouse pad form that I've had for a while, this has all kinds of extra information. It's got small print. I forget what the small print says because it's too small to see. Uh, the, the one for major says major based on this key for composing fine chords in the same column for stuff that works within the key without modulation. Adjacent columns give you the most accessible modulation. Well, or Dorian, which is just the next one over. This gives you a minor third, but also note the major six. The note of which is shown in the Locrian row, second from the top. This, like, I've never remembered all of these notes. And so the print this out and tape it together cylinder of chords simplifies that a lot. Instead, what you've got is these dark bands highlighting what's on the uh, image. And the major one is a slightly lighter gray. Likewise with uh, Lydian and Mixolydian have a major third. Minor is on the end here. So these are the two ones you think about mostly if you're starting with the chord and going, let's make a bunch of chords that fit with this. You'd be starting in whatever note you are in major or minor and going basically across to find likely chords that you can use. But then we've also got stuff like this band is Dorian. Or no, this, this band is Locrian. You want to tend to avoid this one. I was tempted to make it an even darker gray because generally you don't want to make music around uh, a Locrian mode because it's got the diminished fifth, like the devil's note, making it uh, sound really weird and wonky and you can't resolve to anything. Um, Dorian is a lot more popular as far as a cool sounding minory mode that's still consistent. Uh, Phrygian is your heavy metal half-step beginning everything. Lydian is a sort of a major -y with a kind of high singing, what is it, six? I've got it written in the mouse pad. I don't really need to care about that. And then Mixolydian is sort of, I don't know, um, it's the seventh. Seventh jumps out in here. In fact, I have seventh chords written on the Mixolydian one. I've also had one more detail, which is that all the chords that I considered to be easy to play on guitar are in boldface. All the chords that I considered to be 
more difficult to play on guitar are uh, in regular phase rather than bold phase. So you can kind of see what's going to be easy to get to playing it on a guitar down by the you know full chords and bar chords down over by the the nut low frequency chords. On this on the same note, I have been keeping busy doing some other things besides just only this chord thingy. I have rebuilt my whole guitar amplifier setup, namely the isolation cabinet, and you'll hear uh, guitar chords down by the nut through this new uh, guitar cab recording system. For now you might hear more of this. In the For what that's worth. One of the things that I'm doing with the console systems is I want to bring the ability to deliver certain kinds of sounds to your digital audio workstation users, to laptop people, to folks who don't have the resources to go into a big old studio and spend an enormous quantity of money recording stuff and making it sound nice. My feeling is that uh, Genres of music are heavily affected by what's possible, what you can make possible in terms of sound. And part of that is things like coming up with chords, being able to, to use something like this and go, oh, hey, now I know how to do this chord sequence and add notes that sound good around it. Mind you, there has always also been another stream where you can just start doing stuff and see what sounds good. And generally, fortune favors the bold with that kind of thing. In particular, I'm reminded of, for instance, Massive Attack, trip hop stuff out of the UK. And the way that um, early Massive Attack would be using sampling and I've been very interested in sampling. Like I own an ASR-10 because people wanted me to master the sounds of a sampler that badly that they were just like, please, please, please let us do this in the box. Give us these sounds. Give us these feels in the box. And that's what I'm working on. But remember, I won't always do it in the way that you expect. Like clone the piece of hardware by simulating all the little electronic parts and then that will presumably give you the result. Well, no, it won't necessarily. You have to deliver the end result, whether that be mimicking the sound of a whole recording chain that delivered certain qualities or mimicking the expertise of musicians that learned how to use things like chords and came up with riffs and things that went together. And I mentioned Massive Attack because one of the things that they've done in early, probably in lots of stuff, but in particular, early records of theirs, I've heard overlaying of different samples that were throwing in really complicated melodic things. Like you'd have one sample playing one kind of thing, and then another sample happening was playing a bass, and what was going on in the bass was really melodically interesting, but kind of accidental. And it's a matter of being able to hear something like that and go, yes, that's right. That's what I want. So there's going to be more in the way of getting sounds to be the way you want in 2024. I'm actively working on, for instance, more reverbs. You'll hear one now. I've had a bunch of upgrades to my reverb generating software. And I've been doing all of that in the Godot engine. And recent versions of the Godot engine helped me to speed up the search for these reverb algorithms. And uh, it's kind of taken over the live streams I've been doing. Those started out uh, playing Minecraft. I'm pretty sure there's going to be weeks where I basically am just playing Minecraft and hanging out. But the recent stuff that I've been doing in Godot Engine on literally a video game 
has opened my mind to the possibilities of, let's just say, a genre where the new music form could be programming a music machine, not even in a DAW, not even in a DAW, but in a game engine and making it do things where it responds to what you're playing or what you're controlling, making it its own instrument. And I'll be putting out the uh, game that I was talking about, or you can tune into the live streams or check out recent live streams to see what I've been doing there. Basically, what I've been doing is taking a video game about directing a uh, little... Um, white balls or circles with letters drawn on them to the top of the screen. And uh, that's a keyboard-based game where you type the letter and you use the arrow keys to the cursor keys to direct the thing up to the top of the screen. And then it bounces around and it's like a pachinko machine. It's its its, its own little game even without sound. What I added was acid drum and bass and your gameplay directs the background music in such a way where you are not necessarily watching the screen for information like this additional looks like a ping pong ball bouncing around. If it slows down, it starts to shrink. And if all of the little ping pong ball guys are gone, game over. You have to keep them moving. Although you are trying to make stuff go up and those are tending to fall down. So that's the gameplay element. But the music tie-in to the gameplay element is if it starts slowing down, well, first of all, if it's moving really fast, the acid thing has more resonance. So it's squelchier. So you can kind of hear whether you're okay if you're fully in acid town and everything is crazy. Then also the speed of the breakbeat stuff which is strictly Amen Break, but it's the same as I've done with, with this machine back here. I've, I've done that in some live streams of working with it, and I fit it into a game. And that scales with tempo, and the tempo slowly ramps up as you get a higher and higher score. I've tested it out to see that it will still function even if you crank it up to like 240 BPM, where stuff is a little insane. You're probably not good enough to be able to get it up that high, though. And then the breakbeat also synchronizes with the tempo. Oh, also the hi-hat responds. If you're doing something, you start getting a hi-hat backbeat. But then if you stop, it drops to just a, a repeating kick drum. And then if the one that's supposed to be moving around, indicating that the game is not over, slows down enough, it starts ramping up the breakbeats faster than the actual tempo. They start going off sync. They start throwing in weird fills, and they're already throwing in random fills, sometimes including reversals. They're already doing a bunch of weird breakbeaty stuff. But if you hear that going bonkers, that means that you are in danger and you must go and find where the ball is on the screen and hit it with one of your controlled ones to get it moving again so that you have more time. And that's a musical cue. That is a musical cue for gameplay. I don't know how often that has happened in like a Twitch style uh, arcade game type thing, but that's a really interesting twist on things. And that's part of why I'm excited looking at 2024 because I feel like I certainly have more plugins to do. I've got more console versions. We're still interested in looking at, uh, by, by we, I mean, I'm literally doing all of this, but everybody who's paying attention for which thank you for paying attention. We still are very interested in doing things like the EMI Red. Why not do the Sgt. Pepper console? Why not do the Pink Floyd Saucer Full of Secrets and uh, Piper at the Gates of Dawn and Revolver console? That sounds like that would be great. That would be a fine thing to throw in in 2024. More of those brick... I have fired up the Brickosti once more and this time I ran sine waves and things into it. I also ran uh, the guitar sound that I showed you earlier. Here, listen to this. This, this demonstrates what they mean, what Brokosti means by guitar room. Like I had this guitar sound. It's the better 
I've gotten a better guitar sound going. And this is what it sounds like buried in Bracosti reverb of the guitar, specifically the guitar room. I kind of like it. That has, that has some real qualities to it. So I'm getting a lot closer to being able to get in the zone of those patches. Nothing's going to exactly duplicate it because I don't have the same code and I'm not always shooting for exactly the same tone. I'm shooting for one of mine that does the job. But that seems like that'll be an interesting job to do. And uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting. And you're probably not going to see lots of plugins in January. You might, but I do have other stuff to give, such as... Gotta love my uh, chord thingy. I'm getting asked more and more for the uh, arrangement card game, which is also what I've been doing over the last year for composing this music that I've done. I know there's not lots of it, but we'll, we'll get more. That I'm working on that too. I will see how close I can get. I probably need to put another year into making music to be able to actually interest anybody in like what you do with things like these. You know, a card game for giving you ideas for writing music. I mean, it's literally what I have been doing. But that said, I do still need to refine it. There's a lot of art to make to actually make it be a thing. This I have available right now. And one of the neat things about printing it on a single sheet of 8 by 11 paper and then taping it into a circle is that you can put it like this. Now this sounds very hollow inside. Um, and pick a key, say G major. And then it kind of naturally shows you all of the chords that are more or less appropriate. So we can sort of just barely see, well, we can quite easily see that we can go to a D, but apparently we can go to a D flat minor. Certainly it'll be easier to play in a keyboard. That looks like one of the ones that's hard to play on guitar. Or indeed, a appears to be an E7. So if we're in the key of G, we could think up um, a more far removed chord like E7 and we can kind of see it. It's just a couple of steps away. And that means this includes the simplifying things from the initial form of just here's all of the information. Enjoy. Pick, pick one of these chords. That's true, but it's somewhat uh, intimidating. There's a lot here. And if you get this and tape it into a little, and th this, when I like to say you can do this, sometimes it's you can do these chords or I'll show people, hey, here's a mouse pad. If this is interesting to you, well, ask me to, to uh, print these up and buy them. Well, you could, nobody did. That's a bit of an investment. If you can print a page, you can do this. It's even black and white, so a black and white printer, as long as it'll print uh, bands of gray, which hopefully most of them will, you can print one of these and then have it as a sort of little desktop chord assistance thingy. And uh, I'm going to have it being exactly that. And I'm looking forward to continuing the uh, crazy music making type stuff. Like I can... work with this. It's not just a special effect. And I can also take January to get some of my stuff done and get that sorted and build up speed on these fancy plugins I'm promising, like the, the uh, console version that's more like the red console some of these Bacosti things. Again, I can do a lot better than I did with the Cathedral attempt. 
which is cool in its way. Maybe there will be a cathedral too at some point, but I think there's a lot of other ones that will take precedence for being exciting uh, Bracosti patches of which there could be an Air Windows version. It seems like there are many possibilities in there. And the whole purpose of it all is to make it possible for people to create things using these tools that I make available. It's Patreon supported. So if you want me to keep doing this, then jump on the Patreon. If I start earning huge amounts of money, I'll probably buy more gear like the ASR-10 and eventually get around to doing it. People always want me to do the SB-1200. I can't afford one of those. But if the Patreon was doing incredibly well, maybe I could. And then I would be getting that and figuring out how to get excited about um, using it in music. But remember, part of what I'm doing with this stuff is not so much, you know, in this great 70s record, there was this particular preamplifier and I've exactly modified, I've exactly modeled the preamplifier and that's supposed to give you the result. When guess what? Typically that won't. I'm here trying to figure out how to get the sonic vibes and the sonic spaces of these things so that when you start working with the systems I put together, working with the plugins, working with whichever DAW works. I'm getting some static for uh, not supporting Cubase. No, Cubase is not supporting me either, so it's kind of mutual. Um, the idea is putting stuff together where it's not that complicated to get the results you want. You shouldn't have to keep track of every single detail and adjust a million things just right to get stuff the way that you want it. Example, I am currently, thanks to the, uh, the YouTuber and uh, I think London-based uh, DJ and music producer Timba on Toast. Timba on Toast introduced me to James Blake. And by that, I don't mean the famous piano musician and pop star. I'm talking about the same man who was the dubstep producer from way back in the day. That said, I dug a little deeper. I discovered uh, Scream and was very impressed with what was going on there. And then I am rewatching uh, one of Timbo's documentaries and dug into Mala. And that's getting really interesting because Mala is really classic dub production and it sounds it and it's really bass oriented, which is the opposite of what you get out of modern music genres. A bunch of the old stuff was originally burned out of Fruity Loops onto cassettes. I don't know whether any of them actually got made into dub plates from cassettes, but Mala has also heavily been into dub plates his entire career. And it shows in the way stuff is mixed and made. And this did not require Mala to be an expert in emulation on Fruity Loops. Fruity Loops was the instrument, and he simply chose to go through the dub, the dub plate step and chose to voice things in such a way that it would work in on a big sound system. And a whole genre of amazing stuff, and I've been listening to some of his stuff, and man, it's great, comes out of just selecting the kind of communication you're doing musically through things. So we're going to be investigating that kind of stuff as well. Like, what would it take to give people a lens for viewing music through where you could just be working in whatever DAW you wanted and have it set up much like I'm doing with the lettered versions of consoles that would give you results along the lines of how things were shaped when Mala was taking Fruity Loop stuff and putting it through a dub plate and putting it through a cassette doing these things with it without necessarily being really fussed on it has to be this version of the cassette or it has to be this kind of dub plate or I have to have the... When UK dub plates were not the kind of thing where the musicians 
came through and were like, give it a little bit more 10K. UK dub plates were a production line and everybody ran through the same basic system that was set up to be careful to not blow the cutting heads. And I hear it on some of these, you can hear that it's not dissimilar to my mid 70s records. It's not that dissimilar. You could probably do fairly decent dub plate work in the box without ever touching a dub plate simply by choosing console LA or console MC. You could probably make that work because those are already designing in stuff that will control the overly digital qualities of the sounds. The question is whether I can also go in and go, okay, here are a bunch of tracks that were made, for instance, on a Mackie 8 bus, and then dub plates were made out of them. And can I nail, can I absolutely nail the vibes of those sounds so that new musicians can just start making stuff up without things getting too complicated for them and just create, just focus on the music side of things and then get results that sound like classic days of, you know, classic day, days of dubstep or DMB or whatever, back when stuff had to run through Mackie 8 buses and, and such like, because the digital side of things wasn't as advanced, or the stuff that people were working with did include home studio type things. In, in uh, Detroit techno, in uh, early house music, there was also a lot of things like people running through home studio, cheap mixers, and going to maybe DAT if they were lucky, or ca tape cassettes. And stuff was mastered off of that. There was a lot of that about. So there's a lot to do. And I'll get to doing it. Thank you. I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.